Welcome to Being Human. This week, my guest is Michael Quinn Patton. He is a major author in the field of evaluation. He's the former president of the uh, American Evaluation Society. He works internationally and has been an evaluator since the 1970s. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you. I appreciate the chance to talk with you. Right. And I, I admitted to you before the show, I, I've seen you referenced in some of the other guests who've been on the pod show, podcast who have taken a deep interest in complexity. That's where your, your name came up. But before I started to research you, I, I didn't even know that evaluation was a, was a thing, right? So perhaps for our audience who are not really familiar with what that term means from a, from a formal perspective, could you just share a little bit about what, what is evaluation? Well, people of my age are all called accidental evaluators. There was not a field um, when it all began. And so we didn't choose it. Um, you know, it wasn't like in third grade, uh, we said we want to be evaluators. The, the field it emerged in the U.S. Um, with what were called the Great Society War on Poverty programs of the 1960s, where Congress began for the first time writing in requirements that programs be evaluated and there weren't evaluators. So training programs were created. Um, I was a postdoc in the very first training program and then became director of that at the University of Minnesota and in um, the School of Public Policy and Public Affairs in 1975. And the uh, work began to grow internationally with the United Nations uh, creating evaluation units all of the international development agencies have created evaluation units. In 2015, the United Nations declared the International Year of Evaluation, um, and uh, mainly in relationship to the Sustainable Development Goal, because you know, the Sustainable Development Goals began in 2015 for 2030, the 2030 Agenda, um, is basically a set of, of targets. And so there's a huge international evaluation machinery to evaluate the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. And during 2015, there were international training activities around the world. You could have gone to an evaluation conference or training period virtually any day of the year in 2015. We now estimate that there are so over 50,000 evaluators at least part-time around the world, and um, evaluating virtually anything, mostly programs, but policies, SDG targets, um, personnel evaluation becomes a part of evaluation, product evaluation, consumer reports kind of things. Um, so anything that one wants to make a judgment about, we've developed ways of going about doing that. Right. And, and my, my goal with, the, with this episode of the podcast is to take a lot of your wisdom and insight from that world, I guess, mainly focused in international development. And, and, and how can we bring that just broadly to, to, a, to a business context? Uh, right. and, and I found the, the book, your latest book, Principles Focused Evaluation, um, to, be, to be fascinating. I've never been challenged to think so deeply about what, what we mean by a principle and how we distinguish it from a rule and, and what that might mean if we're evaluating um, performance, I suppose, against principles. So, yeah, tell us a little bit about the, the book and, and maybe what we mean by a, by a principle. Well, I was surprised myself um, to find that there was not a book about what a principle is. In fact, one of the, one of the surprising things to me as I worked on the book was that there are a great many books and articles with principle in the title and none in the content. Um, principle is a word that publishers and authors like to use to say, um, I've got something important I want to say, and I want to elevate its importance, so I'm going to say I've got principles. Um, so what I did, which is what evaluators do, is, is begin by saying, so what is this thing? What would be a principle? Um, and uh, to bring evaluation thinking to it, which means asking, uh, does it, is it meaningful to the people to whom it's meant to provide guidance? Um, 
Can, are people adhering to it? And if you adhere to it, where does it take you? So principle is a statement that provides guidance for how to behave, how to think, how to act towards something. It incorporates values, but the difference between a value and a principle is that values are cognitive, they're beliefs. I believe in inclusion. I believe in diversity. I believe in equity. A principle is behavioral. So what does you need a action verb connected to a value to create a principle. And so the, the one of the ways you know you have a principle is when you can articulate a contrary or opposite principle. Um, so for example, with a homelessness program that we evaluated and as an example, as you know in the book, the a principle was to build trust with youth. But many homeless programs are simply viewing their job as getting kids into housing or getting people into housing and building relationships is not part of the business. So um, that's an alternative focus to be outcome focused as a principle and say, our job is get people in housing, don't build relationships. The alternative is housing depends on relationships, nurture trust, and that will have housing outcomes. So, um, the way I got into this, as you mentioned, through complexity, was studying social movements and studying people operating in complexity where um, our usual planning, preconceived targets, preconceived models, highly prescriptive actions that tell us what to do, don't work in complex dynamic environments where things are changing, where you're creating things, where there's a lot of unknowns, where there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, and where people are, are working against a problem, like a social movement, uh, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, Mohammed Yunus microfinance movement, those didn't begin as strategic endeavors. They began by saying the way things are is not acceptable. Things have to change. But they didn't have in clear in mind what that change might look like, but they were heavily principles driven. Mothers Against Drunk Driving believed the punishment ought to fit the crime. And people were, who committed murder, drunk driving, killed their children, um, were getting suspended driver's licenses. And that, that was outrageous. So they didn't begin by saying, we want to reduce the blood alcohol level that constitutes drunkenness. They began with the principle, the punishment ought to fit the crime. Well, having units began with the principle that poor people ought to have access to capital. Um, and so... Uh, principles provide guidance under conditions of uncertainty and complexity where we don't have highly detailed plans or even rules to follow. Yeah, and I can imagine a lot of people in businesses right now, that will resonate for them, right? That they're, 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 they're feeling highly disrupted in their marketplace. They're not quite sure where to go. Uh, and, and I suppose if they could take that step of faith to say, and we're not going to specify exactly what outcome we want or what plan we're going to follow, then actually principles sounds like a, a very sensible path to take. If you've, if you've kind of got the courage to do it, right, it takes a, takes a bit of trust and a bit of faith to go with this approach, would you say? Um, it, it, it does. And especially, as you were saying, in, in the business world, we've created, and in the political world, we've created a, a planning mechanism that believes that competence is having clear, um, measurable goals, clear, specific, and measurable goals, and a clear plan for achieving those goals. And that that's the way that you deal with things in business and with, with government. Um, and so when, in fact, there's a high degree of uncertainty, um, then you working a very detailed plan turns out to be counterproductive because you're locked into something that in a rapidly changing world that may keep you from making the needed adjustments. Right. And, and, this, and this gives you this ability to allow, I, th I suppose, outcomes to emerge. But, but it also, you, you talk in the book about principles pointing to outcomes, right? Can you say a bit about that? Yes, that's a, it's really one of the important points because people think of principles as, as being highly um, process-oriented. Um, but 
they also embedded in them, for example, in organizations that are heavily relationship um, oriented and talk about um, build trust, um, establish mutual understandings between people. The outcome of that is higher degree of social capital um, are organizations where people are able to make decisions uh, together with shared understanding because that's the implication of building trust and having mutual understanding is that that affects then the quality and nature of the decisions that you make, the buy-in of those decisions, which we know are factors that support effectiveness. Right. And, and I think so that, and that, that, yeah, as you say, it's a very important point because people can think of, oh, principles led. It sounds very airy fairy. It sounds all very theoretical. You know, I can't run a business on principles. But actually, as you say, it's possible to, it is possible to evaluate uh, potential outcomes of a, of a principles led approach. Yeah, a great, a great example in the business world Warren Buffett's main principle, you know, one by many the greatest in, financial investor of all time, his entire investment portfolio was based on one overarching principle, only buy companies that you understand. And, and so he wouldn't buy anything that he didn't understand. And so he missed a lot of technological kind of companies, but he also missed the technology bust of 2004. Um, because he, he buys stuff, insurance and, and candy and Dairy Queens and, and um, uh, retail operations that he can understand how they work. He can judge what constitutes good practice there, how to serve customers. And so that, that has served him well. And he's gotten involved in, in some very high finance kind of operations because he understands finance. Um, and during the Great Recession, he became the lender that saved a number of companies because he had capital to lend but he understood what they were doing. And he lent money at a very high interest rate to major corporations and financial groups um, because he understood the business. And he, so that principle has, has guided him throughout his investment career. Right. And in the book, you, you've developed this, this guide framework for, for developing principles. Can you, can you talk us through that? Well, I, I should put that against the the criteria in the international evaluation world, the, um, the major way in which evaluations take place are what are called SMART goals. SMART um, is an acronym that stands for um, specific, measurable, uh, achievable, realistic, and time-bound goals. And so that's the, that's the paradigm is you ought to have SMART goals there's a whole industry that do smart goals. So the parallel guide, G-U-I-D-E, five letters again, um, is a way of, uh, uh, in contrast to smart goals, describing the criteria for a good principle. First, is it actually provides guidance. Um, and so, for example, one of the most common principles I found adopted by uh, nonprofit groups, uh, NGOs, non-governmental groups, um, is do no harm. Well, do no harm turns out not to provide much guidance. Um, life is trade-offs. You, you, you take a leg to save a life. You take medications that give you side effects to deal with a major um, problem. And how would you know if you did harm? Systems change involves somebody winning and somebody losing. So the notion of doing no harm. In the Hippocratic Oath, doing no harm is basically about don't experiment on people when you don't know what you're doing. That's what do no harm is. Don't play around in, in the medical world without a knowledge of what's happening to the patient. It was not just don't do anything if there's going to be harm. Obviously, you're, you do harm to get a greater good. So that's not a helpful principle to actually make make decisions. Um, and so one, the first criterion is that it's real guidance. It's useful. The you and guide is it helps you make those decisions. It, it points to direction and points to outcomes as you generate, as you said. Um, the uh, I is inspirational. That's the value piece of 
principles, uh, something you care about that, that's important. The D is, stands for developmental, which means it's adaptable to different situations. Principles are not highly prescriptive. We've talked about the difference between principles and, and rules. A rule is a stop sign. Stop at a stop sign. A principle is drive defensively. That doesn't tell you what to do. It's made up of sub-principles. Pay attention. Adjust your driving to the weather conditions. Watch out for other drivers. Don't drive distracted. Um, but it doesn't tell you exactly how to do those things. That's what makes it a principle. So it's adaptable to any kind of driving anywhere in the world. You can drive defensively, but that would mean different things in different situations. And finally, the E is evaluable, that you can actually determine if the principle is meaningful, if it's being adhered to, and if it takes you where you want to go. Right. And, and as I listen to you speak, I, I, I see here an intersection between what you're ta talking, I suppose, as a, you could say as a management paradigm is one way of looking at it in terms of how do we, how, how do we lead and manage um, different environments. Um, and and the, this idea of that's emerging of the, to get the best out of people, we want to engage their intrinsic motivation, right? Their, their, their desire for, for, for purpose, for autonomy, for mastery. And actually within a, within a principles-based environment, I can see my space to make judgments, to learn, to, to explore versus a, a rules-based uh, environment where I, there's much less maneuverability for me and, and a lost, much less space for me to grow. Does, how does that sound? Uh, absolutely the case. And the, the only thing I would add to that, one form of, of, of major management, I mentioned earlier, the SMART goals, is that you go around, you manage around predetermined targets. And it's all about meeting those predetermined targets. And what we know is that that, that creates corruption, it creates distortions, because when the stakes get very high and all you care about is meeting that target um, and there's very high stakes in, in meeting that target, um, that, that's the source of um, people doing things that, that disrupt the complex dynamic system and aren't paying attention to the big, bigger picture. So the, the 2008 financial crisis, the Great Recession, was basically from an evaluation perspective a corruption of indicators. Um, the, the, the credit agencies were corrupted. They got paid huge fees to, to say that these collateralized mortgage obligations were of high quality when they, they knew they weren't. We, have a, we actually have a, uh, a law in evaluation, the only law we have, um, called Campbell's Law, named for Donald Campbell, one of the great pioneers. Campbell um, has premised that when any indicator becomes a high stakes indicator, it will be corrupted. And so if, if people are going to make millions of dollars on selling collateralized mortgage obligations and getting AAA ratings for them, they will figure out a way to make that happen. And, uh, and, and it, it corrupts the indicators. We've seen that with um, sustainable development goals where countries get very high stakes for meeting certain targets. And so they play around with the data. Um, countries will pay fathers to enroll their girls in school because the indicator is percentage of girls enrolled in school when there are no schools to enroll in and no right. schools to go to. Right. So how do we ward against that then? So if we've got a principles-led environment, we were saying they're valuable, but then that they're valuable. How do we evaluate in a way that doesn't create indicators that can get corrupted? The, the evaluation itself then has to be principles-based. And as you know, the latter part of the book is about principles for conducting evaluation. Um, which includes things like transparency, um, having multiple indicators instead of single indicators, using mixed methods, both qualitative and quantitative, which in the business world would be both fundamental and technical analysis, um, so that you become narrow and linear and locked into one way of thinking, that the evaluation enterprise itself um, looks from multiple perspectives with multiple indicators with mixed methods 
is dialogic in nature instead of me mechanistic in nature, that it's uh, contextually interpreted, you're paying attention to, to what things mean, and um, um, that in that in that context then, evaluable means that you're constantly having dialogue about what the indicators are, are telling you instead of narrowly fixing on um, predetermined targets. Right. And I, and again, I can see the, the appeal of that in terms of, I suppose, a, uh, a richer, more holistic, less gameable approach to management. But I can also see uh, the, the level of investment that might require. And people might be thinking, oh, God, but that sounds, that sounds like hard work. That sounds complicated. <laughs> but we just have a number. Yeah, the one of the one of the um, well-established principles in in facilitation and in organizational development, which are areas that I do a lot of work in as well, they overlap with evaluation, is what we call um, the go slow to go fast principle. And the go slow to go fast is that taking the upfront time to do things like build trust, have people understand what's going on, get buy-in. Yeah, that takes time, that's, that's hard work up front, but it pays enormous dividends because then you can go fast the rest of the time. When you, when you start off going really fast, set targets, put all your energy into to getting tasks done, but you haven't built that groundwork of organizational trust and capacity and, and people buying in, then when the crises come, as they will, when things emerge that you hadn't anticipated or planned on, you don't have the environment to deal with that. Um, and so going, go fast uh, becomes the upfront principle instead of go slow to go fast, which has this larger context. The other thing that it, it alerts us to that I found a lot of is organizations and companies can have conflicting principles. Philanthropic foundations can have conflicting principles. So uh, I find a lot of companies and philanthropic organizations um, have the following two principles. Um, be relationship oriented. Um, build strong relationships with customers uh, within the company. And be lean and mean. Um, you know, and, and so it turns out those are in conflict with each other. And virtually always, uh, from a board perspective, uh, they're pushing be lean and mean. That's the principle that dominates. And as a result, the relationship piece doesn't get done. Um, um, and so part of the work is to actually look at the ways in which principles um, can be in conflict with each other or may not really provide direction, like, like do no harm which sounds like it would provide direction until you actually try to apply it and try to do a harm analysis or a risk analysis. And it turns out that, that you're into a world, as I said earlier, of, of trade-offs and having to understand the larger context. Right. Right. And you, the a term you use there, which you mentioned in the book, which I hadn't heard before was, or at least I thought I understood, but I think you mean something different by it. This idea of organizational capacity. What, what do you mean by that? Um, capacities become a really big deal in evaluation um, because what we have what we have found um, is evaluation came out of social science methodology. It's heavily methodologically driven. The SMART goals I referred to as example of that. It's very technical, and that's what people associate it with. But what we've come to find. Um, in keeping with the work of people like Daniel Kahneman, who you know, won the Nobel Prize in Economics for his work on decision judgment and how, how people make decisions, is that, that the, the larger issue is what we've come to call evaluative thinking. We have a, uh, one of our professional journals is the uh, New Directions for Evaluation. And we had a special issue uh, just a couple months ago on evaluative thinking which is the capacity then to think evaluatively, to think about evaluation as a way of doing business, not an add-on independent audit function. That's how 
people tend to think of evaluation like the auditors you bring in to check the numbers. Yeah. But evaluative thinking as a, as a way of doing business, as a, uh, a, a way of engaging in the work, is the capacity to think evaluatively within the organization, not having external people come in and do the evaluation, but to, to have these dialogues about what drives our work, what's meaningful to us, what principles are we following, are we adhering to those principles, uh, what would that look like, where is it taking us, that that capacity is built in and is, is a leadership uh, capacity. I do leadership training as a part of my work, and leaders in the NGO sector and in the private sector, when we do evaluation workshops, they send their middle level, lower level technical staff to evaluation training. But it's the leaders who need to understand how to use evaluation, how to think evaluatively, how to think in terms of principles. So I started with some foundation support doing leadership training without using the word evaluation. Um, and we called it uh, results oriented, learning focused, um, reality testing leadership. And so the evaluative thinking was there, but the word E wasn't there. And it became a joke during the training. But basically it was saying, you know, what could be more important for leaders in organizations than making clear what our principles are, bringing people along, uh, evaluating how you're adhering to the principles, how much people understand them, what they're engaged in. Um, that is leadership work. And so that's building that capacity in leaders and in organizations to make evaluative thinking the way of doing business is what we mean by capacity building. Right. So, so yeah, and I completely relate to that idea of it being the external thing. That's been, always been in my experience of, of when we think about evaluation. It's getting in the auditors. Um, but actually having it, the ability to reflect within the organization is what you're talking about here. That's right. Yeah. And, and, and for leaders, inviting genuine feedback instead of leaders surrounding themselves with people who tell them what they want to hear um, mm -hmm. and won't raise, the, won't raise the tough stuff. That requires some kind of organizational development processes, including a principle of inviting genuine feedback, telling right. the truth, speaking to power. Yeah, and, and focus it. I mean, you also made the point in the book that um, – there's this issue of making a hard distinction between process and outcome. Um, and it sounds to me here like you're inviting a, an inquiry not into just the did we, did we hit that number or not, but how are we conducting ourselves? Is, is that right? Yeah. And, and to realize that, that I, mean, I, I appreciate your, your raising this because I think it's one of the critical issues that, that principles raise is We've, uh, in addition to the machinery of smart goals and all the technology and technique around goal setting, we've thereby distinguished between process and outcomes. And so we have the, the go-to approach to evaluation, our logic models, program theory. They're very linear. They're how you're going to achieve your goals. They're the plan for how you achieve your goals. And they make this hard separation between process and, and outcome. But what, what I find with principles, for example, building trust is both a process and an outcome. Trust is an outcome. It's, it's an organizational climate. Um, building relationships is process, but healthy relationships are an outcome. Social capital is both a process and a result. We know that communities and companies and families that have high social capital are healthier in all kinds of dimensions. So social capital, relationship building, is both process and outcome. They go hand in glove. Um, and we learn that by, by looking at how people engage with principles, that it both is a way of doing things, and embedded in that way of doing things are the very results you're trying to achieve. Yeah. And I think that's quite a fundamental shift in thinking there, because because certainly my experience in, in the business world is, is, is dominated by this idea of, you know, where do we want to get? to and what's our plan to get there it's always two questions it's it, it's it's That's this right. idea of the, of those being two sides of the same thing is quite quite a shift i think 
had me stop when I was and reading. The, the the complexity piece around goal setting. I mean, it sounds like some kind of anarchy or, or chaos, um, but in fact, the you know the management consultants um, who work on these issues, like Jim Collins, the and his team, the author of Good to Great, uh, Built to Last, his most recent major book is called Great by Choice, studying companies that thrived after and during the 2008 economic turn back and those that went bankrupt. And he found they were following different principles, that the companies that went under in the Great Recession had simply kept doing their same plan that they already had. They had a strategic plan. They followed their plan, the same indicators. They didn't adjust to the fact that the world had changed. And that none of their presumptions, the plan on which the plan was based, were still operable. The companies that thrived during chaos, um, which is the title of Tom Peters' book in the 1980s, he was the co author of In Search of Excellence, the first really big management book, where he studied high performing companies. And one of the characteristics of those companies in the 70s were that they were, had strategic plans and were very strategic. He followed that up in the 80s with a book on thriving on chaos because most of the companies he featured in, the, in, in Search of Excellence had gone under. Um, right. Controlled Data, the world's biggest computer company, it didn't exist anymore. And he had to go back and look at what happened. And they, they believed his book that they were the best companies. They kept doing the same thing. They planned their work and worked their plan, and they didn't adjust to change reality. Um, and, and so the capacity to realize that your goals have shifted and, and that so many of these goals are just numbers pulled out of an orifice of the body. You know, they're not, they're not actually based on anything. People say, well, let's do a 10% increase in production. Based on what? Um, what's going to change to do that? Why would, why would you do that? How's the environment different? And so um, principles provide a way of, of it's not laissez-faire, it's not chaos. What you often have are much shorter term goals. So one of the things that emerges in a principles focused kind of way of working is you're building social capital, you will have goals for three months. How are we doing um, on implementing that principle? What's the feedback? Uh, how do we need to adjust? It's a set of of small steps that you're constantly monitoring rather than a five-year plan and we're going to do this. Five-year plans make no sense in today's world. Right. Yeah, well, absolutely. And, and, and this process you're describing of, uh, of engaging in dialogue, multiple indicators, evaluating ourselves to get a principle, it, it, it allows for a lot more emergence, right, of, of, of new courses of action. And it also, I think, opens us up to more sense data, right? It allows us to make a better judgment of the environment around us. That's, that's what I hear in this. Yeah, and it, it works at the individual level too. I mean, I, re I recently talked with a, with a guy who's, who's a really serious marathoner and, and trains constantly and he, he sets goals. He said, you know, my whole life is about setting goals and I run so many miles and I run so many hours and People, they, they wear their Fitbit watches and they're counting the number of steps that they take and, and they're folks that are motivated on all of that. And then he said, I fell in love and I had to look at, can I keep doing all those goals and all that time and do a relationship? And so he had to adjust what he was doing to spending time with her, the activities that she enjoyed. And, and he didn't stop doing his running but he had to bring, incorporate other kind of things, do some things that she would do. She would run with him. And it became a real retrofitting of his entire regimen because now there was another important person in his life. And, and his, that value of attending to her, building that relationship, meant that he had to adjust um, the goals that he thought he would have for a long time. And uh, he was able to do that. Uh, other folks other folks don't right right so that's maybe that's a good segue actually the, so my next question was 
what examples have you had of people failing at this approach? And have you got any advice to pass on to others who may be embarking on moving into a more principles led approach? It's a great question. And, and the, um, the biggest thing I, I find is that the larger cultural paradigm um, that requires predetermined outcomes, um, whether it's in philanthropy and the NGO sector, the sustainable development goals in business, that's so powerful that in order to operate in that world, um, people try to start down the principles path, but they find that they're constantly being inundated with what are your predetermined outcomes, what are your goals, um, and that this isn't well enough understood or accepted that they end up getting pulled back into that world. It's a very powerful mental model. It's a dominant mental model, mental model of our times. Um, my favorite example of this um, actually came from President Obama, who, when ISIS first appeared on the scene, and this is reported just this way in the New York Times, you can fact check it, as I'm sure some of your listeners will. When ISIS first came on the scene um, and had done their first major attack, we didn't even know what ISIS was. And uh, President Obama was doing a press conference just before the Eastern European Economic Summit. And he was asked about ISIS. And he said, um, well, we're consulting with the allies to figure out who they are, um, what this group is, and we're developing our strategy. He got absolutely skewered the next day in the press, both liberal and conservative, because it turns out a president of the United States can never say two things. We don't yet have a strategy and we're consulting with other people to develop one. Um, and so he, the, the press was actually on Air Force One going to the Eastern European summit. And he was really angry. He's getting all this stuff about he's not a good leader. He hasn't, he's not on top of it. He hasn't got a goal already and a plan for dealing with ISIS. And he goes back to the press and he says, you people keep reporting that I don't have a strategy for ISIS. I have a strategy for ISIS, which is the same strategy I've had for the rest of my foreign policy. My strategy is this. It's been this from day one. This is my principle, my overguiding principle, my overarching principle. Don't do stupid shit. And he turned and walked out. And then he came back, opened the door, came back, and he said, I want you to repeat, say after me, what is my principle? And he made them all say in unison, don't do stupid shit. And then he left. Now that would that our current president um, followed, that, followed that principle. Um, but there's actually a lot, a lot in that, that principle of uh, it, it does provide direction. It does say don't make knee-jerk reactions. Figure out what's going on. Think about it. Look at the alternatives be strategic in your thinking. Um, and when you get the contrast that we currently have, it tells you a lot about the meaningfulness of a, of a principle like that. But it's, it's hard to do. Um, the the go-to question, we're in the U.S. election right now, and the go-to question that completely dominates um, U.S. politics is every candidate is supposed to come up with predetermined outcomes and a plan for how they would get there on the economy, on health care, and they, the press keeps asking for details, details, details. It actually makes no sense for a presidential candidate to come up with detailed policies. They don't control those policies. They can't control the world. What they should be demonstrating is the competence to deal with complexity, to assemble a good team, to manage data, to build relationships, not come up with a heavily detailed plan for a future that's highly emergent. But that's the gotcha game, and that's, that's the business world, that's the philanthropic world, it's the NGO world. You get judged by your smart goals and the details of your plan. Yeah, it's, it's really, uh, I mean, I think, I think we're touching into the, the paradigmatic shift, and this is what the complexity theories talk about, is that this is a true shift in paradigm, this move to complexity thinking. It's 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 emergent. It's a major challenge to the current orthodoxy, and uh, 
it's 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 not easy for any leader to to make this shift right it takes this kind of courage that as you described there obama taking uh to move in this direction and it's very difficult to distinguish unless you get to know the operations of people and this is what worries folks from accountability point of view is how do you distinguish complexity savvy people from incompetent people because <laughs> incompetent people don't have plans don't deliver on plans aren't able to get things done and complexity folks are highly emergent and and dealing with um changes um so we you know we have this negative stereotype of people who are constantly changing things and doing whatever they whoever they talk to last and the latest idea but i actually find you can you can tell quite a quite a difference because the people who actually understand complexity and have principles can tell you how they're thinking can tell you how they're deciding can tell you what they're looking at can tell you the complex data they're taking in the multiple indicators they're looking at it's not that they're in a vacuum they're hugely thoughtful people um let me let me tell you how big this paradigm shift is and, and an example of it just happening um two examples actually that nicely illustrate this um last month what's well, now two months ago the american statistical association came out with a special volume of its major journal which is called the american statistician and the theme of that whole issue was a world beyond p equal 0.05 for the non statisticians listening uh, 0.05 is what's called statistical significance and when statisticians run numbers and say something is statistically significant it's at a level of 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 confidence of 0.05 um, or 0.01 what the american statistical association concluded is that that leads to mechanistic thinking that the getting a 0.05 level statistically doesn't make something statistical significant there are all kind of things that can be going on and it's come to be used as a rule that if you get that level of significance it's meaningful it's not inherently meaningful there are furious correlations there are all kind of things that go on so they actually have created a rule richard in this volume never 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 say statistical significance so what have they substituted they've substituted four principles four principles amazing principles here in the nutshell is this paradigm shift there are four principles now these are statisticians let me let me set this up a little bit more imagine you you're an undergraduate you go to your first statistics class and you're going to learn statistics and the professor says here's what you're going to learn in this course you're going to learn how to think statistically and we're going to teach you four principles to do that here are the four principles avoid certainty be thoughtful be modest and be open those are now the statistical principles avoid certainty be modest be thoughtful be open that's a huge shift it's trying to get people not to be mechanistic it's getting them to think about data look at multiple indicators the other example of this shift is in 1999 the american pediatrics association formulated a rule called no screens under age two 1999 there are only two kinds of screens big computer screens and tv screen absolute rule they believe that children under the age of two should not be put in front of a screen they weren't sure what happened to their mind to their brain last year they changed their guidance from a rule to a principle the new guidance is no screens under two without interaction the problem was not screens and think of all the kinds of screens we have now i recently saw a mobile that could go over a crib that had six pockets for six iphones that you could put over a infant's crib crazy stuff 
But what they're saying was the screen was not the problem. It was using the screen for babysitting. It was a problem. Sitting a child down in front of a screen and leaving. No screens under age two without interaction has to be interpreted. What do you do with an 18-month-old, a six-month-old? Uh, what's on the screen? What other children are there? What adults are there? But the principle is interact. Keep right, interacting. Gonna, That's how I was going to say, is that helps. a true principle? Because that sounded like uh, maybe just a slightly improved rule. Like, cause, cause that's, so are you suggesting that is a principle or there's an embedded principle? It's or what a principle do you suggest? because no, no screen under two is a rule. Absolutely. Yeah. No screen under eight two without interaction doesn't tell you how to interact. Interaction right. is cultural, it's developmental, it's age appropriate, it's context appropriate. But don't leave your child in front of a screen. Engage with them about what's on the screen. Support their development, support their thinking. And that's a principle. It doesn't tell you how to interact, but it says interact. Right, I guess, but it's, it, okay, so that's a, but it, could you argue it's a, it's a relatively narrow principle versus, I don't know, a principle of um, interact with your children in meaningful ways, or I don't know, something that would... Well, that's, that's, that's clearly the larger, that's clearly the larger mm -hmm. principle. And part of what you found in the book was there, I, I distinguished levels of principles, overarching principles and operating principles, which is the, similar to the distinction between goals and objectives, where goals are broad, objectives are quite specific. So you've quite appropriately identified the overarching principle is interact in age-appropriate developmental ways with your child. But because of the importance of screens in our world, it's worth having an operating principle that says this applies to screens. Right, right. Okay. Um so again, I'm just again, I'm thinking of the listeners here who are like, okay, I'm I'm sold. How do I how do I take this uh, in, into my my team or my organization? And the Obama example is great. That's kind of just kind of brazen it out and 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 push back hard and say, you know, this is my principles. I, almost like I'm not I'm not going to give you what you're asking for, but I'm going to tell you how I'm I'm operating. Is there is there is there a, are there any other successful strategies you've seen for people? moving in this direction as leaders? One of the things that, that organizations have typically articulated in some form are often value statements. You know, they go off to a retreat to generate value statements, they get put on the wall and nothing happens to them again. So a good way to begin is to take a statement of values or even a statement of principles because some organizations have those and look at them through the lens of the guide criteria, look at those values, think about how they would be converted into actionable behavior based upon um, action verbs, and then begin a, a, a process of examining the extent to which those principles are, are meaningful, they're, how they guide the work, how you're evaluating whether or not you're following them, are they in conflict with each other, um, and so, in a way, the principle here is to begin where, where you're at. What do you have in place? Organizations have something in place. Businesses have something in place. Um, and, and so, what, what do we currently have that's providing guidance? If it's a set of strategies, if it's, if it's tactics, look at those through the lens of principles and see how you can take those to provide direction especially in the arena of innovation. I don't want to give the impression that all goals are bad, that I'm anti-goals. Their, their goals are, are, are going to be with us. They're not going to disappear. They're important. They're powerful. This is, however, in the realm of complexity, of turbulence, of rapid change, goals can hamstring us. They can lock us in and keep us from seeing the bigger picture. So where you're operating or doing a particular project or innovating um, under conditions of uncertainty. That's a place to, to be guided by principles, not just make up arbitrary goals when there's not enough information, where the environments are turbulent. Begin in an arena where it's especially applicable um, and, and, and use, it, use it there. You can use it interpersonally. You can use it in relationships um, at home. You can use it in relationships at work with customers, um, up 
up and down the line of the company. I don't try, I don't suggest that people do everything at once, but because there's a learning curve here. But begin by beginning. Don't get the whole thing figured out. Take a principle that's important to people, a value, um, a strategy, get inside it, see what's going on, and, uh, and articulate it in a way that provides guidance, and then evaluate how well you're doing on it. Right. And for people listening, if you, if you buy the book, Principles Focused Evaluation, there's a, there's a ton of examples of, of turning rules into principles, of, of taking what you've got uh, and evaluating whether or not that's a useful principle. Um, so there's a wealth of, of, of guidance in there for people. Thank you. Um, okay, before we came on air, you said you had a new book in the works. Uh, so I'm intrigued by that. You know, what, what's next for you, Michael? Well, the, the sustainable development goals are 17 categories of goals from poverty, ending hunger, climate change, um, with 169 specific goals under the 17 SDGs and 212 targets. So they epitomize this narrow way of thinking. So my new book is called Blue Marble Evaluation, the blue marble referring to the iconic image of the Earth from space. taken in, in the Apollo um, expedition uh, 19, in 1972. And its, its blue marble evaluation is a set of principles for global systems change evaluation. Um, principles like looking across silos, um, looking at multiple indicators, connecting the local and the global um, together. Um, taking a a global perspective, looking across nation state boundaries. The SDGs are all based on country level indicators, but countries don't have control over the major problems that we face, like climate change, air pollution, ocean pollution, human trafficking, um, pandemic diseases. So as we move toward the global crisis that we're in, we need evaluation frames that can deal with that because I've become convinced that evaluation is part of the problem. We have this project mentality. We turn everything as planners do and implementers do into a project or program. Dealing with global transformation is not a project. It's It's a paradigm shift. It is complex. And so I've articulated a set of blue marble evaluation principles for both planning, implementation, and evaluation of how to think globally, act globally, evaluate globally uh, in the face of the global challenges that are ahead of us. And that book will be out in November. Wow. That sounds like, well, quite a project, (laughs) if I can use that term. (laughs) That's uh, that's a very inspiring uh, uh, thought for a book. Yeah. Brilliant. And then you, and so you said that's autumn. You- That's, that will be November. Um, that will be out. And, uh, um, and then um, the book that follows from that is um, The Principles of Transformation. I've got a chapter on transformation in the Blue Marble book, but I wanted to get that out. But we really are talking about, at a global level, things have to be transformed. Not, these aren't small-scale changes anymore. Um, we can't just keep messing around with small indicators and thinking that we're going to solve this through a bunch of projects. Um, you know, the, the UN report says that by 2030, we're at the point of no return on climate change. Um, and uh, we're seeing that more and more. Every time there's new data on a weekly basis, things end up looking even worse. Um, and so this is going to require global cooperation, a set of principles. And I think evaluators have things to offer by being at the table, but not if we bring our traditional way of thinking. It is indeed a paradigm shift for everybody involved. Our entire global machinery, business, NGOs, government, United Nations, is built on the old paradigm. And it's not getting us where we need to go. Well, I'll look forward to that book. Uh, so, so best places for people to, to find your, I mean, if you, if, you, if you put your name into Amazon, there's a, there's a wealth of, of, of books out there. Um, anywhere else you would send people to who are interested in this topic? Um, the, the evaluation associations are regularly publishing, um, the International Development Evaluation Association, 
of people dealing with global and international development meets in Prague in October, and the theme there is evaluating, um, trans, uh, evaluating transformation, and the proceedings of those meetings come out online. So um, if, you, uh, if you do a search for evaluating complexity, I have a book on that, that uh, called Developmental Evaluation, Applying Complexity Concepts to Evaluation. There's a lot of good writings coming out now on complexity as a, as a paradigm shift. Um, and and that, that framing is the foundation for the evaluation discussion we've had. But it has huge implications for business, for NGOs, for government, for everybody. To, to, and, and the statisticians are fortunately leading the way. Um, uh, avoid certainty, be thoughtful, be open, be modest. Right. Well, actually, just on that topic, who, who are your favorite writers on complexity right now? Um, in the l- larger world, um, uh, uh, got the book right on my shelf and the name's not coming to me. Um, the, um, I'll, I'll, send, I'll send you the... We can put them the, in the description, the, right. Yeah, we'll... Yeah. Um, so that I don't get the, the name wrong right off the, the top of, of... I know the evaluation writers, but I wanted to give you a... Uh, James Glick's book, G-L-E-I-C-K, on complexity is a good beginning uh, book. He's a journalist. Mm. Um, Malcolm, Malcolm Gladwell's Tipping Point book is actually still relevant because it's about how networks work um, and his understandings of, of that. Some of the, those are the basics that go back a ways. Um, the more recent stuff is doing more applications, but the fundamental ideas of uncertainty, of emergence, um, those are the those are the things to to watch for. And I'll send you some references that you can post in with your readers. Your listeners. Excellent. Okay. Well, just remind to thank you once again for your time today. Uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I got a huge amount out of this conversation. Um, I hope my listeners do too. Um, so so thank you, Michael, for your time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.